The coronavirus pandemic is affecting many people's lives. To minimize those effects, Congress has appropriated trillions of dollars of spending to aid Americans. That money is going to have to be borrowed by a government already running huge deficits. How will that be possible? And what will it mean for the country in the long term? Charles Whelan teaches public policy and economics at Dartmouth College in New Hampshire. He's the author of the book, Naked Economics, and he joins us now. Charlie, welcome. Good to be with you. The federal government said recently it plans to issue $3 trillion in bonds in this quarter. Who's going to buy those? Lots of investors who are scared of everything else are going to buy those. They're worried about the stock market. They're worried about investing in other countries. It is the best horse in the glue factory at present. The federal government isn't even actually having to pay very high interest rates. So we're getting a good deal on our borrowing. There is demand for now. Hmm. And I understand the Federal Reserve is going to bar buy some of these as well. The Federal Reserve has a unique capacity to buy bonds of any duration, and when they do that, they create demand for that borrowing, and it's one source of borrowing for the federal government. Now, it is, it's a dangerous game. You can look around the world historically, and when governments get into the business of buying, or when federal reserves or uh, central banks get in the business of buying the debt issued by governments, often hyperinflation is around the corner. I don't see that now, but as I said, it is a dangerous game to be playing. All right. Um, so if we're going to count on other investors to invest, how much more could the federal government actually borrow this way? That depends entirely on whether there is a plan for repaying it. The last time that I can think of that we borrowed on this scale so quickly would have been World War II. It was obvious that we should spend that money, and I would say, very importantly now, it is important that we send out checks to keep businesses and households afloat. I don't have any problem with this spending right now. The key, though, is when it's over, do you have a plan in place to pay down that debt? We did it very effectively after World War II. Unfortunately, now we're in a climate where the two political parties cannot agree on a fiscal plan. And I have grave concerns about whether we can assuage the fears of the markets down the road, that, this, that there's a plan for not only paying down this debt or making it manageable, but also paying the huge entitlement obligations that don't show up on the books. That's the social security obligations for you and me and our Medicare and the like. But what are the, what, what's really the option for Congress? I mean, at the moment, if they don't do all of this spending, uh, the country is continuing to experience conditions it hasn't seen since the Great Depression. There is no option in the present. We ought to be spending heavily to keep businesses and households afloat, and we should absolutely positively not raise taxes because that's giving money with one hand, taking it away with the other. There's really nobody who's in save a few billionaires who's in a position to be paying higher taxes, and that's not going to pay off the level of debt that we're seeing here. But there's nothing precluding us from thinking more long-term, and there are really only two options. You can bring in more money, or you can spend less, or I guess the third is you can do a little bit of each. And realistically, I think any economist across the ideological spectrum who looks at where we are says you're going to have to use all the tools. We're going to have to raise revenue, and we're also going to have to curtail we don't necessarily have to cut, but we have to curtail the rate of growth in entitlement spending. And most of that, of course, is health care costs. Mm. Uh, you mentioned one other thing, too, when you were writing a naked economics. The other factor that could help the country in the long term is actually inflation. In, well, it depends how you use the word help. So inflation can clearly help ameliorate your debts. Uh, Venezuela has used it recently. What that means is that your currency lose value, loses value. We think of inflation as rising prices. Economists tend to think of it as the other way around, which is your, whatever you're using, your dollars are buying less. They're really the same thing. But yes, if I owe you $1,000, that's a lot of my income. Another thing I can do if I happen to control the value of my currency is inflate away the value of that currency. So yes, I pay you back $1,000 on paper but it only buys a half of what it used to buy. So in effect, I've canceled half of my debt to you, even though I have honored my legal obligation. Well, that may not be a, a good strategy kind of in the short term, but 
even before this happened, the Fed was aiming for an inflation rate of about 2%. So clearly over the long term, that could have some effect on the borrowing. That is absolutely true. Now, a steady and predictable inflation rate of something like 2% as, is, as you said, the target for the Federal Reserve. That's actually quite healthy. There are a lot of very technical reasons why low inflation is actually better than no inflation, some of which have to do with the effectiveness of monetary policy. But the Federal Reserve has been very explicit. They're saying, we are aiming, we're telling you investors that we're trying to get 2%, which means when I loan you money and I, we calculate an interest rate, I am anticipating a 2% inflation rate. It's an uninflect, uh, unexpected and much higher inflation rate that distorts that borrowing lending agreement between you and I. Mm, okay. You were mentioning before about how the U.S. did succeed in repaying its debt after the Second World War as it eventually plans to do the same here, is there a time factor? How quickly does it need to pay off a debt? I don't think it has to be done quickly at all. As long as you can see runway, that seems like it's gonna solve the problem. So for example, if you were my banker, I got in trouble with, with, on a business loan, and I came in and said, look, I'm gonna make good on this loan. You wouldn't say I need it by next Monday. You'd say, all right, let me see your business plan and let me see your results. And if I'm persuaded over the next couple of years that your road to profitability is going to allow you to pay this back, you'll give me as much time as I need. But it all depends on having a plan in place that is credible and starts to show results, that we start to show the surpluses at the federal level that you need to start minimizing the debt. And it's probably worth mentioning at this point, too, it's not out of the question for the federal government to run surpluses. It did so as late as the 1990s. That is correct. In fact, this is going to feel very nostalgic to anybody listening or watching. There was a period during which the government worried about what would happen if we got rid of the 30-year bond. They thought that the government wouldn't need to borrow money for that duration. They thought, wow, that's such an important tool for the financial markets and investors like it and insurance companies like it. How are we going to survive in a world in which the government is not borrowing? Well, that is not a contingency that we've had to deal with. Yeah. Um, you know, here's a question. Why can't individual states like Maine or New Hampshire do what the federal government is doing as a way to both fill the holes that are opening up in their budgets and uh, help their own citizens? They could. They did before the, Civil, or before the Revolutionary War when states had their own currencies and borrowed heavily like they do now. The difference is after the United States became a sovereign nation, the federal government has the sole power to print the currency. It's in the Constitution, which means that if the state of Maine owes money to creditors, which I assume it does, it can't print Maine dollars with a lobster on the front or whatever that currency would look like. As long as the power to print money resides in the government, they can print more money and pay it to their creditors. States do not have that power. So to summarize, uh, you think we should be borrowing right now because we need to. And, and the key is to make sure that we have a plan in place to repay that borrowing over time, whatever that That's time. True. That's true. And I think at the risk of sounding like I'm, I'm pounding nails in the barnyard door after the horses are out, we should have been more fiscally responsible in the past. We should not have arrived at this point in such a fiscally parlous state. We've just come through a stretch before coronavirus where we had the lowest unemployment rate in known history or in recent history. And that's usually a time when you run surpluses. If, if we were a household, that would be a time when we were at our peak earning and should presumably be saving for retirement and college tuition, those kinds of things. And instead we were borrowing heavily. So then we come into this period when we really do have a reason to borrow and we're just not in the good shape that we would like to be in. All right. Now, um, it turns out as uh, that you, your latest book is called The Rationing, and it's a novel about a pandemic and political and international machinations. What ever inspired you to write that? I, who knew that I would write fiction finally and that it would still kind of migrate towards the nonfiction shelf? I'm a public policy person, and I found that addressing some of our policy challenges was easier through fiction, because you could write a story in which these problems kind of creep up and get you, kind of Stephen King meets public policy. And one of those 
which physicians and public health people and policy analysts have been talking for a long time, is something like a pandemic. Now, a lot of folks thought it would be more of an antibiotic resistant kind of uh, tuberculosis or other pathogen, but this is not a great surprise. And of course, I knew that if we had something like a pandemic, it would set in motion all kinds of political machinations and international int intrigue. So I thought it would be, make for a great fictional plot. And of course, less than a year later, here we are. So I don't want to give away too much, but I mean, does it wind up ending reasonably well for, for people? <laughs> there's, a, there's a lot of bumps along the road, but it does end up reasonably well. All right. Uh, let's see. Is there anything else important about this subject you want to mention that I haven't asked you about? I think I alluded to the one thing that matters probably more than anything else for the long-term fiscal health of the country, and that is getting health care costs under mm. control. When you look at government spending, it is not funding for the NEA, it is not the space program, it's not foreign aid. Those things are increasingly chump change. It is all healthcare, Medicare, Medicaid, and the like. Uh, and it, until we restrain the rate of growth in healthcare, we are never going to get our fiscal books in order. Uh, author Charles Whelan, his latest book, The Rationing, is a novel about uh, a pandemic and the resulting political and international machinations published last year. Uh, Charlie, thank you for the time. We appreciate it. Good to be with you.